pre-recorded from Joe's mom's basement, it's a rewind episode of The Stacking Benjamin Show. Hey everyone, I'm Griffin the Intern, or like the guys down at the game store like to call me, The Fintern. I don't know what type of party Doug had this past weekend for the Administrative Professionals Day, but this place is a mess. I couldn't find a note or anything about what my job entailed today, so I had to get a little creative. I hope the guys don't mind too much, but in the spirit of a dirty basement, I found this Stacking Benjamins episode. The Dirty History of Money with New York Times best-selling author and Grammy Award winner Kabir Seagal. You might consider going cashless after listening to this episode, but that's not all. The guys also answered a question on financial resources for our Canadian friends, and there's always Doug's trivia. One more thing, disregard any investment info or giveaway mentions because this episode was first released in November of 2015. Enjoy, Finn Turn out. Hi, I'm Tom Drake from Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. When I'm not eating poutine, drinking maple syrup, or running CanadianFansBlog.com, I'm stacking Bordens, eh? Live from Joe's parents' half-finished basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show! I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and today we're talking about getting dirty with money. Oh, shoot, no. Sorry, there's a smudge in my notes for my donut. (laughs) Actually, we're talking about the dirty side of money, not getting dirty with money. But trust me, folks, I've done that before. It's way more fun. But anyway, check out our guests, Kabir Seagal. Headlines, a love letter to radical personal finance. A letter from one of our friends north of the border, don't you know? And my awesome money trivia. And now a couple of guys who could use a little lesson about money. Joe and O-J-J-J-J-G! Okay, welcome to another week of the Stack and Benjamin Show. My Canadian accent OG only lasts for about... Two seconds on this show, but then I can't do it. But I like the whole stacking boardings thing, huh? That is pretty funny, huh? Yes, we are Canadian for a day. Welcome, everybody, to another show. Man, do we got a great show today. Kabir Seagal on the show, best-selling author, New York Times and Wall Street Journal, talking about how dirty, dirty money is. Money's dirty, OG. Did you know that? Dirty, dirty money. Yes, sir. (laughs) It is. Something that's not dirty, though, is a trip to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash magnify money and actually even to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash SoFi S-O-F-I are two sponsors on the show I got to tell you it's interesting because both of these organizations wrote really cool pieces that we'll link to in the show notes the first one from the SoFi blog is called I Do D-U-E how to tackle student loan debt without sidelining your marriage and talking about people that are getting married and you know you both might have student loan debt did you and your wife have student loan debt when you got married OG? Uh, I believe so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And did you struggle with it? I believe not. No? Just wham, paid it off? Oh, no. We didn't wham, pay it off. I think she had like a little bit. Most of her college was paid for with uh, scholarships and her parents. Excellent. Um, You married somebody far smarter than yourself. Way smarter than me. Yeah. But they give four tips. Create your big financial picture. I think that's important for anybody getting married to take a look at what you're... Maybe on the same page. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Take advantage of technology, which we talk about all the time. Platforms like Mint, get those downloaded. Number three, define who, what, when. Whether your finances are separate or combined, you need to agree on how to collectively pay all your financial obligations. Decide who pays what. Now, in a lot of marriages, you know, our friends Derek and Carrie Olson believe that one bank account. How do you feel about that? One bank account, several bank accounts. Well, we have several, but it's not out of purposes of this is my money and this is her money. We have different bank accounts for different reasons, but partially with businesses and that sort of thing, kind of separating that sort of stuff. But we do have one main kind of go-to checking account that's ours. We do the whole charge everything and pay it off at the end of the month. And we kind of divvy up the bills a little bit. My wife is in charge of, so to speak, in charge of paying the mortgage with her income, and I'm in charge of paying everything else. So that's kind of how we earmark it in our brains, although all the money goes in the same bank account and it comes out on the same day. But I like that, though, because it fits your lifestyle. And I think the answer isn't as hard and fast as some people think that it is, that it really comes down to the family and actually 
but thinking logically through it, what's going to work for your family. Right. The tip number five, be on the same team. That's stackingbenjamins.com forward slash SOFI. Of course, they are the number one place to turn to when you've got student loan debt, need a mortgage, or to take out personal loans. And the way we know that is because we went to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash magnify money. Nick Clements and the team over there rate checking accounts, savings accounts, all types of personal loan, credit cards. If you've got a financial tool that you use, you want to head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash magnify money. But on the same note, Nick wrote this piece, how a good credit score can make you a better partner. So, so far, talking about I do and student loans together, OG, but also how a good credit score makes you a better partner. It turns out that research from Equifax shows people with good credit scores are more likely to get married. And couples with good credit scores are more likely to stay married. I think that's pretty important. Well, I think that's, you know, is that one of those chicken or egg things, you know, with the whole concept that a lot of divorces, a lot of marital troubles are centered around money. And if you have bad credit score, generally that's because you have bad money habits. Is that kind of... But listen to this. Kind of the cause or the effect people, people tend to find partners who have similar credit scores to themselves. So even when you're going through selecting a partner, you find somebody who's like you immediately. It's just like the bachelorette, right? So you go, will you accept this rose? And you have like a little sign hanging around you that has this like is, my FICO score is 62. Is, and she's like, <laughs> no, I will not accept that rose. I am sorry. I got a 725. It doesn't make the cutoff. I married up in the credit score department. Congratulations. Also. Number three, couples with mismatches in their credit scores are more likely to separate. So, but luckily you were able to hang on there. Yeah. So good I stuff. There. Dragged, I dragged her down to my level. <laughs> I'll link to both of those. And by the way, something that Nick says is that everybody talks about free ways to get your FICO score. There are actually banks and credit unions that provide those for free. And Magnify Money provides a list of where you can find those for free along with everything else. StackingBenjamins.com forward slash Magnify Money. Good stuff. And we'll link to both of those articles from our sponsors in our show notes. But for now, we got some headlines, man. We got to get moving. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show. Our Stacking Benjamins Headlines. Our first headline comes from Huffington Post. This was interesting. It's from their travel section. Christopher Elliott wrote it. Why you should cut up your affinity travel credit card. You have an affinity travel credit card, OG? No, I have probably 17 of them. Yeah, I have two different affinity travel credit cards. So this interests me. The piece says a recent poll bears out something I already believe to be true and I'm happy to see. Consumers are finally losing their enthusiasm for airline and other affinity credit cards. Bank rate, it turns out, is showing that people are showing little enthusiasm for accumulating extra rewards. In fact, half the respondents to their recent study said they wouldn't care if their card stopped offering loyalty rewards altogether. It turns out that there's been a rise in blackout dates. Of course, a lot of the airline cards have changed their program because people used to accumulate tons and tons of points and they made it a lot less attractive. And now, like this one person they talked to said, Dick Martin said this, the points required for any flight were quite high and I also paid $70 a year for the privilege of having the card. I think there's two important things here. First of all, I'm hoping that these airlines see that people are getting rid of the cards and maybe make these programs more lucrative again. I think there's a couple of things to think about when it comes to picking kind of reward cards. I don't agree with Dave Ramsey on everything, but one of the things that he said that stuck with me years ago was you'll never get rich on discovery card points. And if you're going to have a travel visa card or a travel MasterCard or something like that, that earns you points, I think that you have to do it for a specific purpose and know what you're doing it for. Just having the umpty frats airline credit card just to have it is pretty useless because you do have that high fee. There's usually a $100 fee or an $80 fee or something like that that goes along with it. And if you're not actively using that as a strategy to say, okay, here's how I'm going to maximize this for the specific purpose, I think you're missing out. And there's a lot of places online that will kind of help guide you in that department if you're saying, okay, I need to, you know, I want to raise enough points, so to speak, to fly to Hawaii first class. You can look up what that is and you can figure out how to do that. And you can do that without spending $200,000 on your right. on your Southwest credit card, you know. So there's people who do that, travel hacking. Well, and it's funny because they talk about points hacking and about how that lures a lot of people into this game. And I totally agree with you. Yeah, you got to have an exit too on that. Yeah, way. yeah. I love what you said that Dave Ramsey said. I think people need to start with that cash lifestyle. They quote this guy, Thomas Nietzsche. 
from Clearpoint Credit Counseling Solutions and said that a lot of people, when they work with somebody who has severe credit problems, they don't want to give up their Affinity Travel Card. They don't want to give it up because they don't want to lose the ability to earn more miles or the elusive free ticket. And he said that nearly half of Clearpoint's clients, at least initially, refuse to part with their mileage-earning credit card because they have these unfounded fears their existing rewards will be deleted or their credit rating will be effective. He said it's something close to addiction, which is funny because Michael Pava, a psychotherapist and neuromarketer, and what's a neuromarketer? Sounds like a job he created. I know. In Downington, Pennsylvania, he said that compulsively collecting miles is akin to drug dependence. And actually, they do say that neuromarketing is the study of consumers' cognitive responses to marketing stimuli, such as lower prices or promotions. It says an affinity card I'm kind creates, of addicted to that, I would say. An affinity card creates a false sense of relationship of being special, which is exactly, OG, what these companies want you to think. They want you to only use that one card, which is why, by the way, I don't mind that you have 17 different cards Because that shows that you're not looking at one of them. You're open to whoever's got the best deal today. Yeah, just recently within the last, I don't know, four or five months, I think, uh, got a letter from Chase Bank, and it was for one of their products, a Marriott card. And it was, I don't know, 100,000 free Marriott points for spending 1,000 bucks or something it was. So my wife and I each got one, and there's 200,000 Marriott points. Well, my gosh, that's 10 days in a really nice hotel for free. I'm going to spend $2,000 in the next three months on a charge card anyway. So we spent our 1000 bucks each, paid it off, of course, put it in the drawer. And when that thing comes due next year for its annual fee, we'll cut that off and gone. We'll do that. gone. Yeah, do not think this is a relationship because like Dave Ramsey said, start it's like with... A, it's like a lady of the night. <laughs> you just you use them for what they're worth. <laughs> and then you... All right, I got to move on quick. Our next... Article comes from Crowdfund Insider. ING and Cabbage partner to bring platform lending to Europe's small businesses. First stop is Spain. I found this interesting, OG, because, you know, a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about how technology is changing the game, I think this is more proof. True to its name, Cabbage is growing and growing, partnering now with ING. Last week, Cabbage announced a $135 million equity raise led by Reverence Capital Partners as well as ING. They are working with ING in Spain, allowing small businesses to access the capital they need in real time. ING and Cabbage will jointly provide capital through the platform, which aligns their respective interests and creates a unique arrangement in the industry. The companies plan to expand the program to other countries after a successful launch in Spain. There is no doubt in my mind that these banks, as Carol Rolini said when she was on her show, that banks have to get on board Small companies are not going to be able to take over. And I think watching a huge bank like ING partner with one of these really small companies like Cabbage OG really shows that the future is going to be everybody. These small companies like Cabbage are really disruptive in the financial system. Which is good because that's the only way that progress evolves, right? Is that somebody comes in and shakes it up a little bit. Yeah, lower fees for business people to get started, easier ways for them to get access to capital. And you're seeing that on the banking side, right? Lower fees with banks like Simple, like we talked to them. Interesting. Well, companies like SoFi, as an example. Yeah. Yeah, Game changer. Yes. Fantastic. We'll have links to those headlines and more at stackingbenjamins.com. You know, we use money every day. But do you ever stop and think about, like, what is this money thing all about? Do you ever really think about that? What is this money thing all about? No, (laughs) I don't get that philosophical. Yeah, like on a deeper level, what does it all mean? Like, where does money come from? What's the history of money? Nope, not on a philosophical level, not on a deeper level. I just think, give me my dang Chick-fil-A sandwich. Let's go. (laughs) Chop, chop. Yes, I will have whipped cream and cherry on my... I love that. Whenever, Yeah, whenever I get my foo food drink, by the way... I always get it with non-fat milk. And then they say, but would you like the whipped cream? Oh, are you kidding me? I want the whipped cream. <laughs> Duh. Of course I do. Well, the whipped cream on this show, it's such a bad transition. Coming down to the basement, Kabir Seagal. He is the New York Times and Wall Street Journal best-selling author of Coin, The Rich Life of Money and How Its History Shaped Us. Coming down to talk about dirty money. Dirty Money Monday. Dirty. Mm. So dirty. <laughs> I like it when you're so dirty. And Kabir.
Kabir Sagal joins us. Welcome to the basement, man. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Well, I'm glad you would come down here. Mom absolutely loves the book. And I have to tell you that something that you don't know is that this month we're raising money for cancer research. And you know somebody fighting cancer. I believe you know somebody. Let me ask you this, I guess. Do you know President Carter? I do, actually. In fact, I was with him just about a month ago. How did you take that news, being somebody that knows him? Well, first of all, even before we get to President Carter's news, which I found so sad, and he handled it, of course, with so much grace, going public with it. How did you first meet President Carter? Grew up in Atlanta, and I also worked on the John Kerry presidential campaign as a speechwriter and as an assistant on that campaign. So I got to know a lot of the Georgia Democrats and the Georgia political establishment on the campaign. But also growing up, you know, my family was involved in politics down there. That was a businessman or is a businessman. So I got to know President Carter over the years and grew up going to his, hear him give his Sunday sermons at Sunday schools in Plains, Georgia, going to his home and also like seeing him at the Falcons game or the Braves game because he loves sports. <laughs> and we've been sort of close over the years. How intimidating is it, though, to talk to a president for the first time? (laughs) Well, I mean, they're just like any other person in that they're human and have a lot of pride. But President Carter is a very unusual man. He's so productive. The man has written 29 books. He is a master woodworker and he's written poems and fiction. He's cured a disease, guinea worm. You know, when he took over at the Carter Center, 3.5 3.5 million cases of guinea worm. Now there's about 11. The man is 90 years old and he makes you feel like you're not doing anything with your life, right? He's a <laughs> nu- nu- nuclear sub officer, you know, went to the Naval Academy, governor, president. Man's incredible. And I think too many people look at his presidency. This is maybe getting too much into it. People, we're going to be looking back hundreds of years from now trying to understand his presidency just as people went back and looked at John Adams' presidency. He was a one term president as well. So he's a very smart man. And I really like the man and what he stands for. But it's funny, Kabir, that you never hear people say ill things about him. I mean, everybody who's come in contact with that man, it seems, says talks about the same thing that you do about how driven he is and how amazing a person he is. Yeah, he's an incredible humanitarian. I mean, after the presidency, he could have retired and sat on boards and enriched himself. But no, he says, I want to eradicate a disease. I want to bring democracy and monitor democracy and elections around the world. And it's kind of like an old Southern gentleman in the best way that he wakes. He's like, you know, a peanut farmer wakes up, looks at the crops, wakes up in the morning. You know, in the morning I met with him about a month ago. It was a really kind of a moving experience. We went, I was in his office and our meeting was at 730. And at six o'clock in the morning, he had woken up and written an op-ed for the New York Times. Later that day, he was scheduled to talk to John Kerry. And at 6 p.m., he was talking to 4,000 students at Emory University Think about that. The man has brain cancer and he's doing all this stuff. I don't think it surprises you then that he's handling it with so much grace. Yeah, which is phenomenal. My concern is is his wife, Rosalind, you know, and it's tough on her and it's tough on the family. But President Carter, there was a moment there where um, we were talking and he was just sort of staring out into, there's this sort of tree that is outside his office and he looked at it. He said, you know that tree? It's the most beautiful tree I've ever seen. And in that moment, he thought that, man, he's really thinking about his own mortality. And I never heard him talk like that. And But it's definitely, he's taking it with grace and he's definitely kind of coming in grips with, he's lived an incredible life. But if anyone's going to beat cancer, any nine-year-old is going to beat cancer, Jimmy Carter's the man who's going to do it. <laughs> I think he would be. Well, thanks for sharing that with us. And let's get into COIN though, the rich life of money and how its history shaped us. Our theme actually this week, well, our theme today is dirty money. And money Mm -hmm. is really, really dirty. And by dirty, I mean filthy, Kabir, according to your book. Yeah, it's really, really bad. And I looked at money. Now, if you look at, everyone says, oh, we're moving to a credit card-based economy, a credit economy. That's true. But around the world, 85% of transactions are still based in cash. And so a lot of people are touching the money. In fact, I met with John Williams, who's the president of the San Francisco Federal Reserve, and he wrote a paper on this saying that cash is extremely popular. Even throughout the 2008 financial crisis, people were hoarding $100 bills. And what happens? Why do people do that? Because cash is anonymous, but it's also very dirty. And so they've looked at money circulating in Manhattan, pulled money out of ATMs, and they swabbed it. And they found that there are 3,000 different microbes on the money. Microbes involved with staph infections, involved with pneumonia, 
acne. There's even 1.5 billion DNA markers on money. And, you know, I think 50% of them were non-human. And those were, the non-human was, were dogs, horses, even white rhinoceros found on the money. So you want to wash your hands because money is really a public safety, public health hazard. I guess that maybe I should also stop washing my cat with $100 bills then. Is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> Whatever you do in the basement. I mean, I guess <laughs> what you know, I thought about you the other day because I came across a wonderful Teddy Roosevelt quote. He said that some man can live up to their loftiest ideals without ever going higher than a basement. There it is. That is totally us. Money also yeah. is dirty, Kabir, because it does things to your brain. Yeah, money is bad because it stimulates our brain in a way that makes us get excited in a way that's maybe deleterious to our financial decisions. So they looked at people who are high on cocaine and coke addicts and they scanned their brain. And then they looked at, they saw this part of the brain that activates when you get high on cocaine. It's called the nucleus accumbens, the nucleus accumbens. And it's located deep within the sort of evolutionary part of the brain. And it fires incessantly when you think you're about to get ahead of cocaine. And then they looked at people who are about to win some money, about to make some money. And they compared the brain scan, kind of overlaid them, and they found that they're nearly identical, that the nucleus accumbens, the same part of the brain, activated at the prospect of winning money. And so the nuance here is that it wasn't so much the receiving of money, it was the thought of winning money. So the expectation of gaining something is more exciting than actually getting it. The prospect of gain is more exciting than actually getting it. I mean, so people have made the conclusion that money is akin to a drug. It gives us a high. You know, it's like Pavlov's dog starts salivating at the prospect of food. Most of us start salivating metaphorically at the prospect of making money. It's why the casino Um, parking lot is full 24 hours a day. Probably, yeah. And the other thing is when you go to a casino, they do things to jack up our nucleus to come in. So when you're sitting in a casino and there's a pretty woman coming and serving you drinks, for example, that's to get an activation in your nucleus accumbens, in your reward center. And what's happening when you do that, you're being driven a lot of times out of emotions, not out of sort of pure rational thought, which is your prefrontal cortex, which is, is being, your decisions aren't being manifest there. Maybe you shouldn't play that one hand more, two hands more if you're doing well. And so this is a field called neuroeconomics, which are basically brain scientists that scan your brain while they're making financial decisions. And they, some neuroeconomists looked at the comparison between naked women and money. And they said, what gets the most excitement in the brains of heterosexual men? So they showed pictures of naked women and, uh, <laughs> and money. And what got the most excitement? It was money. Money got more excitement, more stimulation in the nucleus to come. It's in the reward center of the brain than naked women. And so it just goes to show you that, I mean, people say, why is that? Well, what is money? Money is really a substitute for, I mean, for energy. It gives us the stuff we need to survive. And before you can reproduce, you have to survive. So maybe it makes sense that money gives us more excitement before we actually go after the pretty woman. Yeah, what is that? Arthur Schopenhauer philosophy, I think, our drive to live, which is why people like to eat and have sex and money drives all that stuff. Yeah, I remember that Churchill quote too. He says, familiarity breeds contempt. But he said, without familiarity, there'd be no contempt at all. (laughs) Is this why, by the way, that wealthy people are considered by many people to be mean? You know, you've seen those stories and some of the research that shows wealthy people being meaner than people that aren't wealthy. Yeah, I think there's something to that. And there's also some studies that show that even if you have money, they've looked at how folks sit. And if you're wealthier, the way you sit in an office space is you put more distance between you and someone else. Because what happens when you have money is you're less reliant on the community, on relationships to sustain you, whether it's the village, the town, your your family network, you're more autonomous. And so you're not as beholden to other people. Usually, and I get into this in my book, there's something called the gift economy. So for example, if you go to Starbucks and you buy your coffee and then they say, oh, hey, wait a second, you can have the coffee for free. All of a sudden, you're going to feel sort of obligated to them to go back there. Maybe you owe them something. But instead, if you just pay the money and leave, there's no existing relationship. The relationship is terminated because the money has completed that transaction. And so I bring this example up because wealthy people can just use money and terminate a relationship. They're not beholden to other people. So indeed, there is something to be said for wealthy people that they may be more stingy or they might come across as less needing of relationships. There is a study actually that shows, and I talk about it in my book, that $75,000, which is well above the median income in America, but $75,000 is kind of what you need to be relatively happy because that takes care of your health and, you know, general fortune. 
But after $79,000, you don't get materially more happy. Your happiness does not grow linearly with your wealth. And that number, again, is for America. And so it goes to show you you the people who are most worried about money are the people with a lot of it and and also with very little of it. Those in between are generally doing okay or generally happy. I want to go back to the money and cocaine and naked women. Let's talk about naked women more, Kabir. No, I'm kidding. (laughs) Sure. (laughs) Is it different for people? Do we have different reactions when it's physical dollars than when it's it's credit cards? I mean, I'm wondering how the move from physical money toward using plastic changes the reaction that we have chemically. So the changes in the technology money does change our physiological reaction to it. So using a credit card, when you take your credit card and swipe, it's actually dulling your pain, dulling your sensitivity to pain. Because when you use your credit card, there's less activation in your anterior insula. And the anterior insula is a part of the brain that fires when you're feeling disgust or anxiety. In fact, in the insula, there's something called spindle cells. Spindle cells are found in greater quantities in your digestive system. And so when you make a bad financial decision or when you like don't feel good about an investment and you just feel it in your gut, that's what's happening is your interior insula is sort of triggering those spindle cells throughout your digestive system so you can kind of feel it viscerally. And so I bring this up because when you use your credit card, you don't feel the pain in your digestive tract in your oh. anterior insula. It doesn't get at you. But when you use cash, you do feel more activity in that part of the brain. And so that's why this works it out. I mean, some examples like Apple computers you know, there was a class action lawsuit filed against them because kids were spending all this money on games on the iPhone and iPad and the parents didn't even know about it because like the kids were so easy to buy something that maybe they weren't feeling anything bad. I mean, imagine if every time they had to buy an app, they had to fork over two or three dollars of cash. It may prevent them from racking up all these fees. So indeed, there is a physiological chain as we move from paper to plastic. But we still feel the same pleasure through buying. Like the pleasure firing doesn't change, just the hurt. Yeah, I mean, broadly, yes. I'm sure it's different for everyone. Yeah. But broadly, yes. You know, it's funny because you talk about hard money, about soft money, about the history of money. And I'd love to pick your brain on all those things, but I think we'll have people read the book. What I want to talk about, though, is money is dirtied by art. And by dirtied, I mean there's art all over money. And you talk about this extensively in the book. What's the prettiest coin out there that you've seen? What's your personal favorite? You know, in writing that book, I traveled to over 25 countries. I was a banker at J.P. Morgan, and it took me around the world. And I had the good fortune of meeting coin collectors. Almost everywhere I went, I asked a coin collector, what is your favorite coin? How does it represent the society in which you live? And it's kind of random, but probably the most interesting coin I found was in the Philippines. It's called a counterstamped coin. And what's so fascinating about this is because on this one coin, you can see literally civilizations colliding. What do I mean by that? So during that time, around the 1830s, Philippines was a colony of Spain. And also during that time, Spain was taking money. All the metals in the world were coming from its colonies in Latin America, like Colombia and Mexico. But these colonies were revolting against Spain. So what happened is these colonies started printing on their metal coins like revolutionary mottos. And so the Spain was like, well, wait a second, we still need these coins to distribute in the Philippines. So they would take these coins that had open revolution, like, you know, down with the Spain <laughs> um, messages, and then they would stamp over them and reissue them in the Philippines. So the coin literally looks like it's a beautiful coin and it says like revolution. And then it has on top of it, a little counter stamp, a little circle with the crest of the king or queen, queen of Spain. So literally you have civilizations colliding And then even more so than the Chinese who were trading with the Philippines, they didn't really trust the quality of these coins. So then they started putting a chop mark, like a Chinese character on it to determine the metal value of it. So you would have, you know, a silver coin with a revolutionary motto with a king or queen's imprint on it with a Chinese like alphabet mark, essentially. So you have four civilizations colliding on one coin and they only circulated for about a decade or so. They're very rare to find, but I found it to be one of the most intriguing coins I came across in my research. I'm surprised they circulated for that long. Yeah. And there's all kinds of theories of why it died out and so forth. One of the, yeah. one of them is just that the dye did not last in, in Manila that was used to cast the coins. But really, money's really, it can tell you so much about the society in which it was made. I mean, if Spain 
which was, you know, a superpower, you know, in a short time after that, it was gone from the Philippines and the Philippines became an American colony. But everywhere you go around the world, you can learn about the history from looking at the coins. And even in America, there's 150 million people that have participated in the 50 state quarters program. You know, those quarters that have yeah. the different states. Oh, we totally did that with our kids. We completely did that with our kids. Yeah. So, I mean, 150 million people is amazing because a lot of times this was the case in earlier periods that a coin was oftentimes the only type of like metal that someone could hold, you know, because they didn't have a museum. Now times are different, but 50 years ago, coins were the only type of kind of democratic art that people could touch in their hands. And so coin collecting has been called the hobby of kings because the hobby goes back thousands of years, but it's been democratized with the internet. And it's sort of a fascinating thing to see people's coin collections. Yeah, that is cool. I wanted to ask you about this in the movie National Treasure. I don't know. Did you see National Treasure? I haven't, but try me anyway. Well, yeah, because you're going to know where I'm going with this. So they talk about money, right? Let's go to the U.S. money right now, Kabir, because 90% of our listeners are in the U.S., and there's lots of hidden stuff on the dollar bill. And so and it all has to do with the Masons. And the Masons have hidden all these things on the dollar bill. Is it true that there's stuff hidden on the dollar bill and were the Masons involved? <laughs> it's true that the stuff are hidden, but it still remains to be seen if it was Masonic symbols. I mean, the pyramid seems to be a Masonic symbol, but some of the things that people have attributed to the Masons are not, don't stem from the Masons. So the, the Masons tend to get a little more credit than what they actually came up with. But actually, one of the things that I found fascinating, and I doubt it's in that movie, is the crest. If you look at the back of a dollar bill, the great seal of America has an eagle on it. And in its beak, it's holding a ribbon and it says E Pluribus Unum. And people think it's an American symbol. I mean, the bald eagle. But that symbol goes back over 4,000 years to Great Babylon, Society of Babylon, where you have this epic called the Itana Epic, which is basically a story in which there's an eagle fighting a snake. And that symbol of an eagle fighting a snake appears in Hindu Indus river civilization, you know, thousands of years ago near India. It shows up on the crest of Pope Clement in Rome. It's also on the crest is the national symbol of Mexico, an eagle like fighting a snake. And then on our money, it's an eagle with not a snake in its mouth, but a ribbon. And it says E Pluribus Unum. So a lot of these symbols aren't just American. They're like kind of universal symbol go back for thousands of years. That's really cool. And I'm sure there's tons more hidden on a dollar bill. I'm sure this yeah. is the only thing. Yeah, I, mean, I would say there's a hidden 13. There's 13. If you look at the back of a dollar bill, there's a uh, pyramid. There's 13 layers to the pyramid, 13 steps on the pyramid. E pluribus unum, 13 letters. There's 13 arrows in the talon of the eagle. There's 13 leaves on the olive branch that is holding in its other talon. There's 13 stars above the eagle. So if you look very closely on the sides of a $1 bill, on the back of it, there's 13 pearls on each side, which is kind of people don't often see that. And 13 colonies, I mean, the number 13 signifies the 13 original colonies. So that's why they embedded it into the money. I found that so fascinating. Now, you mentioned earlier you work with J.P. Morgan and you helped put together this IPO for this little company called Alibaba. I'm sure nobody's heard of that company. But is that why you decided this project was for you, Kabir, was because of your relationship with money and Wall Street? Yeah, I started working on Wall Street just months before the credit crisis began. And I was really intrigued with what was, I mean, horrified, but also intrigued with what was happening because people were losing their jobs and the people losing their houses. But I asked another question. I mean, I didn't think the world needed another book on the financial crisis. And I probably wasn't the best person to write that book. But I wanted to write a book about money. And I asked the question, What's going on in our minds? What's going on in our brains when we deal with money? And so that's why I, I began this quest in earnest. I traveled to, again, over 25 countries, every hemisphere. I looked into the biology of money from different animal species. Do they use currency to the future? Like what kind of money will we use in space? And it became an all-consuming quest. And I had the vantage point of working not just in an investment bank at J.P. Morgan, but really at a research library because Anything I wanted to know about money, essentially, I had access to the great minds, not just to J.P. Morgan, but just sort of an entree into top portfolio managers and economists and policymakers. And I could always ask them a question or two about some nebulous topic. So it was a great place for me to be at that time. And I'm glad I'm glad the book is done. Oh, I bet. Because it just seems like such an epic. And obviously, being a New York Times bestseller, a Wall Street Journal bestseller. By the way, where were you? 
Because I think every author I've talked to knows exactly where they were when they found out that they were going to be on the New York Times bestseller list. Where were you? <laughs> My editor like, gave me a heads up. She says that the book's selling really well. And I was just, I think, walking across the street and there was an ambulance going by. But I knew I had to pick up the phone. So I picked it up and she said, and I didn't hear it at first because of that ambulance. And I said, say it again. She said, you're a New York Times bestseller. I said, <laughs> All right. I did the whole like Tiger Woods yes. <laughs> Oh, I'm surprised that's all you did. I would have done just a big old happy dance, but who knows? Yeah, there may be some jumping jacks involved too. That's awesome. And coins available everywhere then, right? Yes, everywhere. How do we follow you on social media, Kabir? On Twitter, my Twitter handle is Hi Kabir, H-I Kabir, K-A-B-I-R. And then on Facebook, you can just search my name, Kabir Siegel, S-E-H-G-A-L, and you'll see my Facebook page. And we'll link to all those in the show notes if people are out on their morning run or riding their bike or in the car or whatever. We'll have that in the show notes at stackingbenjamins.com. Okay, so my last question is this. People often start projects and they have, you know, preconceived ideas in their brain, but then they study the subject and they learn that they were wrong. And now that this epic book is finished, where were you wrong about Coined? I was wrong in thinking about the history of money in that, you know, Adam Smith and even Aristotle said that money was invented to replace bartering. And that's sort of what we always learn in Economics 101, that, you know, I have an apple, you have an orange, let's do the trade, and it's bartering. But there's been anthropologists that go back and have looked at this, and one of them at the University of Cambridge says, well, wait a second, there's actually never been a society in the history of the world that's ever existed when bartering was used as the principal means of exchange. I mean, bartering is what you do with someone you're never going to see again. And so... I looked at, what does she mean by this? And she says, well, people do favors for each other. Debt, social debt is the first type of currency, like the gift economy. And I started realizing as I travel the world that almost universally, people think about money as a measurement of debt. Just as you think about a mile or a kilometer as a measurement of distance, think about money as a measurement of debt, social debt, financial debt. And so I started to see that the link between money and debt is so fundamental to understanding the idea and concept of money that it wasn't bartering that led to money. It was debt that led to money. And that's why I think it's a fundamental finding the new scholarship around history of money. Hey, everybody, it's Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, with today's awesome trivia. Since we're talking about the history of money, what's the oldest coin in the world? I'll be back with the answer in a jiffy. Did I honestly just say jiffy? Hey, stackers, it's time in the show for us to help you solve your money problems. First of all, if you're somebody with a bunch of credit card debt, you've got to change that behavior. Let's work on changing it. The first thing we have to do is get open. And we asked Nick Clement, the CEO of Magnify Money, head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash magnify money to reach them. Why people don't talk about their credit card debt. I know. I wish we would. If, you know, if you remember when you're in school and you look left and you look right, and one of these people right. will. Well, one of these people will have credit card debt, and and it and, and probably will be you at some point in your life. And because we don't talk about it, because we're so ashamed, we're so embarrassed, what we end up doing is nothing. We stay put. We don't come up with a plan to get out of it. We don't negotiate better deals and refinance. And so it just becomes this this horrible, quiet problem that 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 can make someone feel awful. You shouldn't be ashamed. Almost one out of two people have it. Speak up. And only when you talk about it and deal with it can you get out of the problem. So, of course, we don't talk about it. But you know what? If you don't hold yourself accountable, you'll get nowhere. Then once you decide that it's time to make things better, head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash magnify money for not just better credit card options with 0% interest rates to help surf your debt to lower rate, but also for better savings accounts and checking accounts. And if the change you're trying to create in your life is to buy a new home and you've got a high credit score, guess where you should go? Stackingbenjamins.com forward slash SoFi. That's S-O-F-I. And as we've talked about before, you go to SoFi because of their incredibly low rates and their easy system of getting approved for loans. You'll know in most cases within 10 minutes. But we asked Dan Macklin exactly what types of loans they have on mortgages. 
SoFi offers a, a 30 year fixed and a 15 year fixed and a, a 7 1 adjustable rate mortgage. The, the key difference with our mortgages is we require as little as 10% down payment on those mortgages. So you may only have 10% of the purchase price, and that, that can be good enough for SoFi. And importantly, we don't charge any mortgage insurance. So for many people who haven't yet saved up a huge down payment, we're a great option. StackingBenjamins.com forward slash SoFi, S-O-F-I. When your change in your life is either a new house, refinancing student loans, or taking out a personal loan to get rid of debt. Hey everyone, Doug here with an exciting trivia answer. The question was this, what's the oldest coin in the world? As you could guess, the answer isn't definitive, but most think the Fleur de Coin, at 2,700 years old, is the world's oldest chicken feed. It's got a lion carved into it, and it comes from an Asian miner. (laughs) Asian miner? I thought there was another donut smudge on my sheet, and it said Asian miner, but it it actually says Asia miner. Where, Where the heck is that? It's probably out near Nebraska or something. Anyway, I'm going to go find a map. Check you next time. Big thanks to Kavir Seagal for joining us down in the basement. It's always fantastic when a best-selling author agrees to come down, isn't it, OG? It's weird that best-selling authors never come back <laughs> after we've... No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, there's no correlation there between the smell of the basement, speaking about dirty, and people not coming back. But thanks a lot to Kavir Seagal. Just fantastic interview. And a guy, you know, the whole discussion we had at the top of the show about knowing Jimmy Carter... I mean, that's just, what would you do if you walked into a room for the first time with former U.S. president? I mean, that would be kind of cool. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty wild. All right. The letters. Doug brought down the mail. First letter comes to us from Dan. Dan said he recently found his podcast. He's been listening for a few weeks. The way we present information is entertaining and the topics have been interesting and very applicable. Our recent podcast on student loans and the five worst rules of thumb were really great. He recently finished grad school with no student debt. How about that, OG? That's good. That's nice. And he's been able to start saving each month as he started a job as soon as he graduated, which is also great. The only catch is that outside of the 5% he puts away through an RRSP program at work, he's from Canada. So he's stacking Borden's, not Benjamin's. Mm-hmm. How about that? Okay, so we got to change this because he didn't actually write this letter that way. I read <laughs> that all wrong. He said, I don't know where I should be putting the rest. I come from an old school family where GICs rule the day and trusting a mutual fund advisor isn't wise. Too many secrets. I would really like to try and develop some long-term strategies, don't you know, so that my money's working for me. That's not very good, is it? That's terrible. Yep. Yeah, that's rotten. I'll stop. <laughs> so that my money's working for me, but don't know where to start. With most people my age fighting to pay off student debt, most of the things I read is directed at younger people. And those are about debt and much of the other literature is directed toward baby boomers and retirement. So, do we know of any resources? Canadian content, of course, would be extra helpful that might be useful to start him on the right track. He'd like to start learning about more options and develop a long-term strategy and his own opinions for saving in the future. He can see long-term goals being buying a house, ensuring he can take care of his family, and continue to have resources to spend his free time whitewater kayaking. How fun does that sound? Anything would be great. Thanks a lot for the question. So, what do you think? Let's help Dan out. Well, a couple of things. First of all, the reason that those GICs look so attractive is because they have guarantees behind them, right? And people like to have guarantees and things that are unguaranteed or non-guaranteed, I should say. The reason that sometimes other investments might seem a little scarier or untrustworthy is a lot of times people don't spend enough time understanding what they are. Like the mechanics behind them and how they work. You know, mutual funds in general are pretty well regulated. And you can read through the disclosure documents and find almost any piece of information that you want about that product. So I wouldn't turn away from mutual funds. I don't know that he was saying that in particular. I think he was talking more about mutual fund advisors, he thinks. They have too many secrets about how they're really paid. Yeah, maybe. I can understand that. But it's in there. The disclosure stuff is in there. It tells you exactly how everybody's paid and how they make decisions and that sort of thing. Right. You have to invest in investments over a long period of time that are going to outpace inflation. 
Otherwise, to your point, what you always talk about, you end up having to save exactly the amount of money. You never use that compounding effect of some lo- some bigger growth things. So a lot of different resources. Canada certainly has certified financial planners. They have fee-only financial advisors in Canada, National Association of Fee-Only Planners. There's a lot of different places where you can turn to for professional advice. If you're looking for information on your own, I would look at the kind of bigger picture stuff, kind of philosophical stuff, kind of right out the gate. I would read things like The Millionaire Next Door and just from a behavior standpoint, learn how wealthy people build their lifestyles. And that doesn't matter which country you live in. I mean, oh, any, God, that, that anybody be, listening to this show, country, no matter where yeah. you live. You know, I would look for information and books from professionals that you hear about all the time. We've had Rick Edelman, for example. He's got a great book on how money really works called Truth About Money. So if you're going after an education type background, I would start real broad based and build the philosophical base of how you're going to think about money and finances in your lifetime. And then if you're looking for technical expertise, you can kind of dive into that if you really want. But I think you'd probably be able to find a professional advisor out there that will kind of sync with the way that you're thinking about things. Not much to add there on what OG said, Dan, but I also think that my favorite Canadian resource when it comes to books, love the Rick Edelman idea. I love the Millionaire Next Door. I really like David Chilton, probably my favorite Canadian writer about this topic. And his book is called The Wealthy Barber. And he just did a new edition of The Wealthy Barber not that long ago. And The Wealthy Barber is such a great book about making the most of your money. And I like some of the things that they say. The two things that David Chilton says that I really like are your plan should fit on a napkin, right? And definitely not the entire plan because I remember when I'd help clients develop a financial plan, we would build these milestones. And of course, I'd include in the plan all of the work behind how we came up with a milestone, But the milestones had to be very crisp so that my client, as they were going through their daily life, just knew what the priorities were, right? And if you can't write your priorities and what your strategy is to reach those priorities on a napkin, you're probably doing it wrong. I think you should be able to easily do that. I like that advice. I also like the fact that, you know, he said everybody focuses on budgets and he says budgets are baloney. People do what they have to do. So get the money saved that you need to save. And then with the money that's left, then decide how you spend that and use a a cash-based lifestyle, you know, until you get that rhythm down. We talked about that earlier with the affinity cards. Mm -hmm. Affinity cards, horrible if you don't understand a cash-based lifestyle. So fantastic letter there from Dan. Second letter comes from Dale. Dale actually wrote to us that he wrote to our friend Joshua Sheets. I was on Joshua Sheets' show recently, the Radical Personal Finance Show. And he said, hey, just wanted to write to you about this letter. So I'm going to read a letter. How's this for meta? I'm reading a letter that Dale wrote to Joshua about us. So he said, hey, Joshua, just wanted to say I really enjoyed your podcast with Joe Saul Sihai the other day. I've been listening to you both for a couple of months now, and I really enjoy both. In spite of what Joe says, you both cover great topics that are relevant to me, and I learn from both. Of course, he's referring to the fact that I talked about we don't teach anything on our show. Definitely not our goal. He decided to get his financial act together earlier this year, and Dave Ramsey's book and podcast was a motivating factor. However, he no longer feels the need to go to the whipping post with Dave. And as Joe mentioned, I've graduated to a big boy conversation about money. I can do the right things with money. I was just never motivated to do so until now. So I turned to folks like you and Joe for some grown-up conversations on my money and how to best manage it. I wanted to bring that up, OG, because I wanted to be clear about, because I often get to talk about this stuff on other people's show. But because we address so many different things on Stacking Benjamins, I don't get to talk about this, which is that people like Dave Ramsey and Susie Orman are fantastic places to start. And we talk about the launch pad of life. But once your rocket ship's taken off, you graduate from that lifestyle to things that will serve you better. I think Dave is a great place to start technically, but you got to agree with me when it comes to choosing the right funds to reach your goal. I'm not really that excited about Dave's advice. Are you? On the mutual fund side, no. Yeah. No, I'm really not. And definitely Susie Orman, when you're talking about investing, holy cow, not fantastic there. But her approach on a healthy respect for a dollar and taking your money and lining it up in your wallet just so that you have that tangible. Now, after what Kabir Seagal said today, I don't know that I want to put my hands all over my money. You got to wear those like UV protected gloves. <laughs> That's right. Wear a whole bodysuit, 
right? And then like a hazmat suit. But lining up your money and getting that tactile feel and the respect for the actual dollar, I think, is a great lesson for people to start with. But then graduate to people like Rick Edelman or to somebody like, you know, people run into trouble when they start off with somebody like Jim Cramer, you know? Well, like I said to Dan, our last writer, Dan, to Dan yeah. you know, you have to have that philosophical base of how you feel about the way that you're going to behave overall with money. And when you have that, then the rest of the decisions fall into that kind of those values that you've created for yourself. You know, if you say, okay, I want to be like the millionaire next door and you read through that, you read Dr. Stanley's stuff, you say, that's what I want to do. That's how I want to shape my life. And then you go to the jewelry store and say, boy, but that's a nice $3,000 watch. You would feel the conflict in there and say, okay, but that doesn't line up with the value that I have of this. Not to say that there's anything wrong with $3,000 watches. I'm sure they're very nice. But people who want to be middle-class millionaires or the millionaire next door don't drive brand new Mercedes every year. That's not what they do. So you got to get that kind of base knowledge, the base kind of philosophical stuff first before you dive into option call put spread trading. That's that's what I was going to say. Yeah, I love the Motley Fool guys and I love the Motley Fool approach, but start with Dave Ramsey before you go to the Motley Fool. Yeah, good stuff. Thanks to both of those guys, Dale and Dan, for sharing. It's D-Day on the podcast. Dale and Dan on the show. And Canadian Day on the show. How about that, eh? Good stuff. If you've got a note for us, send those to Joe at stackingbenjamins.com, and we will get that letter on the air and see if we can help you with a question. By the way, if you have a lot of questions, take a look at our course because we have a do-it-yourself course Take your time and work your way through what we call the first two cornerstones of financial planning, which is getting your financial house in order and then making sure you have yourself protected adequately. Those two cornerstones are at Stacking 101 Benjamins. It's stackingbenjamins.com forward slash 101. You will find more about that there. And also, when I talk about the rocket ship, I wrote a white paper on that. You can find the white paper on the right-hand column of stackingbenjamins.com. Just scroll down toward the bottom and you'll find your own personal finance rocket ship. Hey, we got some good news, OG. A couple of fantastic writers talked about us recently. Chanel over at Bright Sense wrote an article, How Podcasts Changed My Life and Some to Listen To. And believe it or not, she thought that we were one that people should listen to. How about that? Pretty cool. Yeah. And then our friends over at Wisebread, I say our friends, but Wisebread is a monster financial site, wrote the five best money podcasts. And it was your typical big names like Planet Money and Marketplace. But this one little show called Stacking Benjamins made that list along with our friend Farnoosh over at So Money. So congratulations to Farnoosh for making the wise bread list. And we made it too. Somehow they put us on that list. Thanks to those two organizations for recognizing just how incredibly great we are. That's it, OG. Another show. And there's a lot of so much. November, huh? I can't believe it. We should talk about that because at the beginning of the show, we started off with Farnoosh and I, even before the beginning. I hope that people will help us. And not just because we're in this epic battle with Farnoosh and so money, but because of the fact that it's great to give back and love the Texas 4000 message. Head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash Texas and the number 4,400. We're going to have Shelby on the show. I mentioned her, the woman that we're helping raise money. And by the way, it's funny. So why are we helping Shelby? None of this money actually goes to Shelby. It all goes to the Texas 4,000. But these riders ride on behalf of people. They ride for individuals. And Shelby has a great story. We're going to have Shelby on the show later this week to talk about her amazing story. And you'll see why we want to help her raise money for cancer research. So good stuff there. But it's time for your favorite part of the show, OG, the big so what. What should people have learned from today's show? Why don't I go first? No, I'll go first because you always steal mine and I want you to have to think about it more. (laughs) Deal. I didn't know that when we were getting ready for the show, I don't know that we planned on this, but we had a couple of discussions about it. 
about your philosophy about money and how you want to be as you grow up with money, so to speak. And we don't spend a lot of time on that. A lot of time we spend time on tactical things, right? Like getting the best interest rate on this or finding the best advice on this. But I think that's a good place to start. And if it's been a while since you've read some of those kind of broader based philosophical books about money or heard some of those things about money, it might be a good time to go back to that and really kind of get back to it. There's a number of books that I read every single year just for the grounding that they provide. And, you know, a piece of that is how you feel about money and how you want to be around it. So, no, I think that that's fantastic. The other is fantastic because I said it, you didn't even have to think it. I mean, you just know in your soul that if it comes from me, it is fantastic. So here's my big, so what Canadians are a lot like Americans, nice people, but GICs and RRSPs, you know, very, very similar. Should we all hold hands and sing? We are the world now. Good stuff. eh? okay. Okay. Do my bed. Thanks to Tom Drake for an awesome introduction today. Thanks to Kabir Seagal for coming on the show. You can learn more about Coined at our show notes page, stackingbenjamins.com. You'll, by the way, get his information and his book and some cool stuff from Yoram Bauman, who's going to be coming to the basement on Wednesday. Yoram Bauman is the stand up comedian economist. And we're going to be telling economic jokes. Remember how we had the Planet Money guys on in the spring and they bombed? Well, they weren't the experts. Now we got the guy that really knows what he's talking about. So right. it's going to cool. be great. That's coming up on Wednesday. Stack of Benjamins. This show is the property of the Free Financial Advisor, LLC. Copyright 2015. This show was edited by Joe Salcihai and Isabella Bianca. Special thanks to Kabir Segal for sharing from his book, Coined. You'll find that book and more at stackingbenjamins.com forward slash store. Special thanks to OG for pointing out that Asia Minor is, in fact, a long, long way from Nebraska. here at News Center 4. I'm Ron Burgundy. You stay classy, San Diego. Did we ever get a winner from last week's trivia question? We did. Well, you said you knew what it was, and I never heard your answer. Well, let me tell you, because I did get it right. So the first answer that came in, let me go with, we had several, several answers within. I'm just going to do the ones that happened before 10 o'clock. Well, I'll go 10 a.m. So we had four people before 10 a.m. Central Time that answered. Brett said a field reporter. Is that correct? That is not correct. No. Do we want to go over what that was again? No. I don't have it in front of me. I can find it. <laughs> no, that's fine. James, 10 minutes before him, said a reporter. That also, not correct. Dustin, at 7.30 in the morning, said a meteorologist. That's a good also one, too. not correct. Because you just talk about what, rain or shine, whatever, in there. Yeah, that was not it. And our correct answer was actually the very first one I got at 5.30 a.m., up early. Jeebus. And going at it. Ryan. Ryan said the answer to OG's question is a referee or umpire. That's what I guessed. Yeah, that's not right. It is a news reporter. Was it really a news reporter? Yeah. <laughs> you got to be kidding me. It's not yeah. a referee? No. i to get it out and read it again. I thought for sure because it was the big event and your crew, right? There's a referee crew and umpire crew, and it didn't matter what it was. We're, we always try to tell the truth. I was sure that was a referee. No. Nope. Well, I mean, I didn't create this on my own. I I understand that, which means that James actually was correct. Well, you said field reporter, and then you said reporter, and I was like, picky, are you wanting to get on this? Well, no, I'm saying, well, that's because I thought it was umpire or referee. Oh, okay. So, yeah, I would say reporter is probably. James, you were the first one to get it. James, write me, joe at stackingbenjamins.com. As soon as you hear this, I will write you I guess we should script this maybe a little bit in advance (laughs) so that you... 
so that we actually know what the right answer was. But that's fine because I didn't write anybody back. I didn't say oh, uh, okay. that Either. they were correct. Not. Nope. Didn't tell Ryan. But I was sure at 5.30 a.m. that Ryan had it. No. How about this one? You're so smart. How about you get this one? This isn't for anything other than your notoriety. You can get into it easily if you're not careful, even though it lacks physical form. Getting out of it can be very difficult, even perilous. What is it? A lie. Eh, close. Trouble. Into trouble. Yeah. Uh, see, I'm terrible at those. I read those. And go, eh, I don't know. <laughs> I got no idea. All right. So James, it turns out, James, write me. I'll give you a week to listen to the show. And if I don't hear from you, then I will write you and tell you that you won. But you're taking a Hallmark prize pack of the three great financial books from Steve Roberts, Football and Financial Planning, from Philip Buchanan, Staying Rich. Love that also. And then the other game, Big Weed from 